G'day there, you're watching the Aussie BIM Guru, and today I'm covering a topic which is 5D BIM or estimating using Revit, so cost and quantity specifically. So thanks um, to Mo for his request on this one a couple of months ago. It took me a while to get to this topic, so um, thanks for your patience, and hopefully you're still watching. Feel free to drop me a comment just to let me know what you thought. I'd also like to thank Ashley as well for sort of motivating me to get onto this topic, because uh, I've been talking to him about how he could potentially leverage Revit in his business for cost. Um, so some really great and interesting ideas I've been able to share with him, and hopefully it helps his business and how he works. Um, in this video, I'm going to specifically cover four key areas or sections of the presentation, so feel free to jump ahead if there's particular ones that relate more to what you're looking for. I'm going to start off just by explaining 5D BIM, what it covers, what it is, the implications, and why it's important. From there, I'm just going to mention some key considerations in how you can set up a 5D BIM analysis uh, workflow for your office using a variety of tools, but specifically Revit. Um, and I'm going to show you four methods in Revit you can use to do takeoff and cost analysis straight out of your model. And also just conclude with some general tips just to finish up the presentation. But um, 5D or estimation is essentially one of the dimensions of BIM. So you've got 3D modeling or existing conditions, 4D for scheduling time and construction, 5D for estimation and cost analysis, 6D for sustainability and energy, and 7D for facilities management and operations. But we're just focusing on 5D today. And specifically, we're going to be focusing on two aspects, which are cost planning and quantity takeoff. So how many for quantity takeoff and how much for cost? Um, two of the most important questions when you're leading a project into construction and you're trying to procure it. So in simpler terms, um, we're really just talking about money, methods of establishing a cost bench line uh, using our model or a benchmark. So for the professionals, um, I want to make sure that you're aware that I'm not a quantity surveyor. I'm really just an architectural BIM manager. So I'm coming from this perspective. So there is actually programs out there that quantity surveyors can and should probably use if they're going to be doing their job. Um, I've heard Cost X is a very good program. That seems to be one of the leaders in Australia for selection. But there's other ones in different areas of the world, such as one I know called Presto, which is quite popular in Spain. Uh, so feel free to check this out if you're interested. Anyway, some key considerations when you're establishing a cost or estimation workflow from your Revit model um, is that BIM is actually really good at 5D when it's done right. Um, it's also really bad when it's done really badly as well. Um, so I guess you don't have to be a bean counter. You don't have to do everything manually. Um, so try and take advantage of all the tools you have at your disposal. Try not to fall back on the easy way that um, you're familiar with that maybe is a lot slower than the potential ways you could learn or try. Take a risk. Um, and I guess just to drop a meme, um, if your BIM model isn't good, you're going to have a bad time. You've got to put the effort into your model before you delve into cost because accuracy is so important. Um, so there's just some things that model it properly. That's usually one of my main bottom lines when it comes to cost in Revit. Um, so make sure you use 3D Revit families. Um, make sure you model accurately, you manage your data carefully, and you use the right categories of elements for scheduling. So don't do things like this. Don't draw things in 2D or use model lines to represent things that have a cost associated with them or a quantity associated with them. For example, this table that's been added to this model. Um, no one I work with has done this. I just did it as an example. But I have seen this done before where people have come from an AutoCAD background or something similar and they don't understand the importance of quantities and type control. So really be careful about working like this because you're really taking away the smarts of the BIM model. Um, as well as this, uh, keep in mind that things should be modeled correctly or as they would be built in the real world so you can get accurate quantities. Let's say in this case, we're trying to take a quantity of the paint on these walls. It wouldn't be correct because they're going through the roof at the moment. And whilst in floor plan or a drawing, this might look okay, in the model, we know it to be wrong. So if we went and checked a quantity takeoff schedule for these materials, we could over order on the paint required for the project. Um, usually there's QA measures to stop these things happening in BIM, but just be really careful when you model to think about how you're modeling in all dimensions. Um, keep in mind that data is critical in BIM when it comes to cost, because things, things need to be told what they are and what's special about them, what dimensions they are, because how else can we cost them? Uh, when we cost in BIM, we rarely actually use the 3D geometry of the element to measure. We're typically taking data instead and extrapolating that into schedules. So here's a door, for example, that comes out of the basic sample project. And I would say that this door is horribly inefficient. It has almost no information associated to it. So we really couldn't get a lot out of it. I mean, the most critical thing that's missing 
is it doesn't even have a type name. So I don't even know really what it is um, aside from the data I have here, which is very limited. Um, as well as this, here's a door I would say is good. It has a lot of information. It has a type. Um, it has fire ratings. It has uh, a lot of dimensions associated with it that I can get. They're all shared parameters as well. So really important that you can schedule these. And there's codes, descriptions, so I can actually limit uh, a schedule to show me particular things. Let's say I only want to see doors in a multi-category schedule. I can filter by does the description contain door, for example. Um, and I guess, think about this. Imagine that the pair of shoes that you wear are going to be turned into a Revit family. Um, so as soon as something's in Revit, Revit only understands what you tell it. So let's say that this shoe is categorized as telephone devices. Um, you may as well just start using your shoes as a telephone. If the category is wrong, Revit has no way of fixing or understanding that this is a mistake. So it's really important to consider things like casework versus furniture, especially equipment versus generic models, and which one you use, because you need to schedule these things together sometimes. Keep in mind that all plumbing fixtures should be kept under the category plumbing fixtures, so it's really basic stuff usually but it's really important to keep it in mind. And above all, have a strategy. Uh, software doesn't dictate things to us, we dictate to it. Revit's really just a program that's a tool. It's a framework to execute BIM. So you need to tell it how the cost system works. You can't just expect it to do it all for you. If the program makes a mistake, it didn't make a mistake, you made a mistake. So make sure you really think about your system before you dive into it. Um, so four methods I'm going to cover in Revit, so now we're on to the good stuff for the Revit users. Um, I'm going to cover four, so I'll start off with the first one, which is what I call unit cost by count. So imagine this kitchen, and I'll show you an example in a model in a second as well, so it's not just talking. Um, but imagine you just want to figure out how many chairs you have times their cost. Uh, it's, it's very simple, you're really just setting up a very basic formula to find the total cost. So let's jump into Revit, just into the basic sample project. And let's just generate a schedule for all the furniture in the model. So I'll just create a schedule. So this is the best way to extrapolate quantities out of the model. Keep in mind there's a lot of considerations when you're setting up a schedule, like is everything phased correctly? Um, have I double, double modeled elements in the wrong place? Is everything in there in 3D under the right category? I'm going to use a furniture schedule here. You could use a multi-category schedule as well if you want to pick up multiple elements in a single schedule. So what we'll schedule about this is we're going to use family and type to identify the different elements and what they represent as a cost element. So we'll get the family and type. We're going to get the count, which is, which is a special field available in most schedules, which will tell you how many of something there are. We're going to get the cost as well. Um, so we'll just stick with that for now. Under sorting and grouping, we'll just sort by family and type. So let's see what we get. So what we're going to get is what's called an itemized schedule. Every row represents one element. Um, so you can see that the, that is the case because count is always one. We don't want to do this. We want to de-itemize our schedule so that the rows represent the sorted element. So we're sorting by family and type. All you have to do is tick off itemize every instance. And depending on how you've sorted your schedule, it will clump them together in rows. So now you can see this row represents all six bar chairs in my project. And you can see that the count, because it's a special field, has accumulated how many of those occur in each row. At the moment, none of these elements have a cost. So there's two ways to add cost to a family. It's actually a special parameter called cost. So let's just go find this bar chair in our family browser and we'll add a cost to it. So at the moment, in its type properties, cost is going to be empty. So at the moment, we need to associate a cost to it. Let's say this bar chair only costs $120 each. So what you're doing here is put the unit cost. And now you can see we have six of these for $120. Note that this isn't a total. So we actually need to do some more work to make this into a total. I'm just gonna really quickly just pump some numbers into here. Um, let's say dining chairs, 300. The TV has shown up, so that's interesting. Uh, this is a good example of how you should need to categorize things correctly. So we've got a TV here under furniture. I'd argue that should probably be specialty equipment or electrical equipment because it's an appliance, it's not really a furniture object. Um, so just a good example of how you should be mindful. And obviously this is coming out of the Autodesk sample project. So it goes to show that you can't always assume Autodesk is gonna get everything 100% right, because ultimately they're not architects, they were software developers, they were just taking their best guess as to how people are gonna use their program. Um, so nothing wrong with what they've done, um, just not how we typically work. 
Let's just take the sofas. And I'm just giving everything a cost in the schedule. So this is the unit cost, not the total cost for more than one of these. If we want to make this reflect the total cost of each row, we need to go to formatting, select the cost field, and where it says no calculation, we go calculate totals. So if I OK that, now this is the total cost of the row. So that's much more important. You could also do a calculated field as well. So what we could do is just get rid of get rid of this calculate totals and go back to a standard row. And we could also go and add a calculated field. And the only time you do this is if you want to see the unit cost and also the total cost. And we'll just call this cost two. So this is a calculated field. It's not actually in the families, it's only in the schedule. We'll make this currency based. And we'll just say that this is the same as cost. It's essentially the same parameter twice. For this one, we will calculate totals. We'll call cost, unit cost. You could do it either way around. You could actually make the cost the unit costs and vice versa. Um, but essentially we're just overriding what the header is called. So if we okay that, now you can see we still have the unit cost, but then we also have the total cost as well. If you want to add the dollar sign, um, that's easy too. So under field format, unless you want to change your project settings to always show dollars, you can just deviate from the project settings and add dollars there. So quite easy. There you go. And if you want to do digit grouping, so like every three numbers you get a comma, um, that's easy as well. So let's just say for the total cost, field format, and we'll just use digit grouping. And there you go. Now you see we get that comma like you would in a usual write-up sheet. So that's pretty much it. If you want to see your grand total, your overall uh, spend on furniture, just turn on grand totals and turn on totals. You can do counts and totals as well if you want to see how many pieces of furniture you have. Um, let's just do that. We'll do both. I think we also need to say the count generates a total as well, actually. Yes, there we go. And there you go. You can see we have 30 pieces of furniture. And then we also have uh, $14,000, 220 expenditure total. And because we're in BIM, the beautiful thing is that if we add things to the project, our schedule will update as well. So let's say we add another chair and another table outside to our project. So watch the numbers. It's 14,220 at the moment. Voila, our cost adjusted to suit the quantities in the project. So this could be maintained in your project as a cost schedule. Um, so really important and really useful to understand as well. And you could obviously rename the schedule to something else. And if you're happy with the schedule, you can actually export it to Excel. So under export, if you scroll down to the bottom, reports schedule it'll output it as an xml or a txt file um, a delimited text file is what they call it so we just go save and you can check your delimiter here there's a few settings i usually just say okay and then if you just navigate to that file on my desktop in this case i think we just drag and drop it onto excel so I'll open excel drag and drop and there you go, that's our schedule. Um, it comes in unformatted, obviously, but it, it's all there for the for use. So really easy, and you could use Dynamo to hook that up as well. So this is one method, there's three more. So it's a little bit of a long video, but hopefully this is all really helpful. Um, that was my demonstration. Uh, so method two is what I call rate cost by data. So this is the same thing, you're still quantifying, but you're doing it on a different basis. You're taking something like a dimension of an element and then using that to drive a cost. So this could be like the length of a structural beam, for example. Obviously, the longer a beam is, the more expensive it is because you're paying for more steel. So in this case, to say that you just cost a beam on a unit cost is wrong because the length will be different in different scenarios and you need to associate some sort of cost rate to it. This is where it's really important to have a strategy because if you don't know how much you're paying per lineal meter of a certain size of steel member, then it's very hard to make your BIM model do that because you have no, no formula or no rate to apply to it. So really critical. So let's just do that as well. Let's just use a, a steel beam as a reference. I'm actually just going to make a new project in this case. Just a architectural template. This is the default Autodesk template as well, so no smoke and mirrors. And I'll just keep this open in the background. So I'm in my new project here. All right, so let's just model a steel beam. Actually, let's model two of them. So I'll do one here, one here, and yeah, that'll do. 
I'll just jump into 3D because they're outside my view range at the moment. They're under my view range. Let's just edit the family because we're going to need to add uh, a ratio or a formula to it to calculate its cost. Because currently, whilst this beam does have a cost parameter, you'll notice that it can't be changed. It's always a type parameter. This is a problem because the beams adjust themselves on an instance basis. So we can't actually get the formula to follow. What you need in this case is a second parameter to deal with cost on an instance basis. And then we add this to the default cost parameter in a schedule, or we ignore it depending on whether the elements in that schedule use both cost fields or not. This is the only way I know to get around this, unfortunately. So what we're gonna do first is get a reporting parameter to report the length of the beam, because this length is a special length. It goes all the way to the end of the beam, even if the beam stops sh sh short. But if your beam has extensions on it, this is actually the reference plane that will derive the length of the beam. So I'm gonna add a reporting parameter on an instance basis, and just call this report length. And this should be added in the family now. What we need to do now is make a shared parameter. <clears throat> the reason we use a shared parameter is so we can schedule it in the project. So I'm gonna add one from my, my company shared parameter file. Um, just under data. So essentially this is just a currency parameter that I've added. As you can see, I have a pretty extensive shared parameter file I've set up where I work. Um, so you can see it's just a currency parameter under the common, common discipline. It's all it needs to be. So let's add that just under identity data because the other cost is under there as well. But let's make this an instance parameter. And we want to derive this by a certain rate. So let's just say that our flat rate is that every millimeter of steel beam that we create um, costs us a dollar let's say i don't know what the going rate is for steel but let's just say that for now and obviously it might be different you might want to add other factors into the formula like the size of your steel profile or the volume so the area of the face of the steel profile lots of factors to consider for now i'm just going to ignore that so you could use a section area for example what i'll do is i'll take this reporting length copy its parameter name and i'll set up a formula so I'll say that this is equal to report length times, uh, we'll just say, what was it again? Uh, one, so one dollar. If I click and try to finish this formula, it gives me an inconsistent unit warning because we're timesing length times currency. The problem with a, a length field is it maintains its unit. So what you need to do is manage its unit out. So I'm going to divide it by a millimeter. And there you go. Now you can see it rationalizes because we're managing the unit out. It sort of works a bit like cancelling out like a negative or something like that. Um, if you multiply two negatives, you get a positive. It's similar. If you divide a unit by another unit, you end up with something unitless. Um, the same can apply to square meters and volume as well. The only difference is you have to divide by meters squared, meters cubed, etc. But there you go. So now what will happen is as this changes length, it should adjust its cost as well. So pretty exciting. I'll just, I'll just load this into project one that I've created. We'll override its parameter values and we should have an instance parameter down here there you go you can see our cost alternate currently eighteen thousand four hundred dollars that's an expensive beam um, let's change its length and now we can see it's fourteen thousand eight hundred so we can see that the formula is working because we're doing a dollar per millimeter so we can see that connection and that relationship and if i change my extension you can see now that my reporting length and is still 17,020, so is my cost. But notice that my length isn't. So that's where that extension versus length behavior comes into play. So a little lesson about beams as well, just snuck in there on the side as well. So that's how you can do a unit cost. Um, from there, it's just the same process. You just create a schedule. In this case, I'll create a structural framing schedule for my beams. We'll just add their family and type. And you don't have to use family and type. You can use description, family, type, all sorts of fields. Um, keep in mind family and family and type and type are tricky because you can't use them in filters. So sometimes description is better. The key is having the right descriptions in there that are unique as well, because if they're not unique, it'll be hard to make them row items because they'll try to group themselves together if they have the same descriptions. Uh, but what we'll do here is sort by family and type. And I'll just also add my cost ultimate. And if you want to manage out your cost and your alternate cost into one field, I'll show you a trick for that as well. So here's your two costs. Um, you could add count if you wanted to. But what we're going to do now is add another calculated field and just call this combined cost. And it's going to be currency. And it's just cost, cost alternate 
plus cost. This way, if one of them is zero and the other one is zero in another case, they'll always combine to give you the whole cost of the, the element, regardless of which parameter they use. So let's just okay that. So notice that my combined cost is empty. That's because you need to set the cost parameter to zero. If you've got a family that's always only using its alternate cost, it's, it's really easy. All you have to do is go in the family and in its formula for cost, just lock it down to zero. And that will always make that field zero, no matter what. So we'll just go back to project one, back to our structural framing schedule. And there we go. It's interesting. I must have, must have done something. It's not showing me zero there, but it's still showing me the combined cost. So I'm wondering if there's maybe a graphical bug that caused that to be hidden for a second. Yeah, there we go. It was a graphical bug. And then you can pretty much just hide your two cost fields under formatting. Let's hide costs and let's hide cost alternate. And all we see is our cost. So that, that's a really easy way that you can do it. Um, and let's say you have maybe like two different types of beams. So you have a UB, maybe you have a smaller UB. Let's say we just have one that's 165 by 20. So I'll just go find that different parameter. Uh, whoops, 165. There we go. So if we go back to our structural framing schedule, you'll see we have two beams at 165 by 20, uh, by 40 and one by 20. What we can do in this case, if you want to make them sort of separate areas of your cost schedule, and while I'm here, I'll just go and quickly calculate totals for my cost. You can also, you can sort with a header. So what this does is it separates them into areas and you can also add a blank line and that sort of subtotals or your elements, because what you can do with that header is add a footer and just call it totals only. And you can get subtotals as well, as well as your combined total if you go to grand total and you turn on totals. And that will give you the major total down the bottom and subtotals per member. So you can see how much money you're spending on each type of profile, for example. So really easy ways to break up your schedule. Um, I'll probably do another tutorial on schedules at a later date, but I'm going to try and cover some of the the most important cost scheduling techniques in this one, but that's technique two. So technique three is a little bit easier because some of the work is done for us. So this one is what I call a rate cost driven by inherent data. So these are parameters that come by default under certain categories. So if this could be like floor area, for example. Um, so floor area is something that we don't have to calculate. It's just driven by um, the, the, the size of the floor that you draw. And all you have to do is associate a cost rate to it and use a calculated field in a schedule. So I'll really quickly show you how that works. And then I'll show you something that's a bit trickier that comes with this, which is walls. Walls are a lot harder than floors. So I'll just really quickly model up a couple of floors. I'll just do two of these and one of a 300 millimeter floor. And in their type properties, I'll just give them a cost rate. So note that this isn't a unit cost, this is a per square meter cost. So I'll say this is $15 a square meter and the 300 millimeter type is $30 a square meter. Then if I create a schedule for floors, I can add a family and type or any other parameter essentially and the area and the cost. Then I'll sort by family and type, turn off itemize, okay. So you can see that we have two of these and one of these. So what we need to do is go into area and turn on calculate totals as well, because two of those floors were the same area. So it reports its area as 62 square meters, but it's really telling you those two floors in that row both have the same area of 62, but combined they have 123 square meters. So be really careful with area and cost when you don't calculate the total in the row, because that can be quite sneaky if you're not careful especially when you have copies of elements that just happen to have the same area or the same cost. Likewise, we could also just really quickly uh, add a calculated field for the total cost. Oops, I'll just cancel that and keep the area in my schedule. Okay, so I'll add a calculated field and just call this total cost. And this again is a formula. So this will be the area times the cost. So again, we're gonna have some challenges with units here. If I try and okay that, I have inconsistent units. So what I can do is just 
divide by one mill millimeter, divide, oh, sorry, by one meter and one meter, not one millimeter, sorry. Be really careful which units each thing is working in. Areas in this case for me are working in meters. And then you, let, you see it lets it through after that. And then from there, we can just calculate totals, field format, and we can just say two decimal places with dollars and digit grouping. There we go. And now you can see we have our total cost. And because this floor, there's half as much, but it's twice as expensive, we end up with the same cost. So that was just a little way to test if that was true and correct. And likewise, you can go to the total cost and you can calculate totals and you can turn on grand totals as well. Too easy, right? So pretty simple. Walls. Now walls are a lot harder um, because walls, the way they're measured is quite challenging. I'll try and explain it, but you probably need to experiment just to really understand how this works. So I'm just going to model a wall. I'll just do a double brick wall. So note that this wall is comprised of a few layers. It's got a masonry brick on the outside, an infiltration layer or an air gap, and then a masonry or a block wall on the inside. So different materials in each layer. I'm just going to model one wall to begin with, and I'm going to model it for, let's do one meter, and I'm going to make it one meter high. So we know that its face area is a meter squared. Okay, so let's just see how this looks from a, cost, uh, a scheduling perspective first. So we're going to focus on just a couple of parameters that relate to the wall. So we're going to pick out family and type, of course. But then we're going to focus on two ways of measuring the wall. One is area and one is length. And the wall has a cost associated with it. But it's important to note this is a system cost. This is everything in the wall combined. How expensive is it per... Now this is important too. So you've got a cost or a rate associated with the wall. But what's the measurement ratio based on? What is this cost applied on? Revit won't tell you this. You could measure it based on linear meter or face area. Um, obviously face area probably makes more sense because it's a result of the height and the length more or less. So let's say in this case, this wall system costs us $50 a square meter. So if I go back in my schedule, we can see that now we have a cost, a length and an area. So the thing now we need to figure out is how do we want to measure this? But before we do this, I'm going to show you what happens when you introduce another wall that's joined to it. I'll do another wall, a meter long, and I'm just going to add a comment to them so you can see which wall is which. So we'll have comment one is one, and comment two is two. So we know both of these walls at their center are a meter long, but that's the important part. So you'll see why. I'll add comments. So let's see what's what's being told to us about these now. So I'm just going to go to formatting, check my area, and I'm going to make my rounding just a little bit more so I can see what I'm dealing with. Three decimal places. They're different areas. Um, so that's quite surprising, right? You wouldn't expect that. One of them is 1.135 square meters and one is 0.865 square meters. So together they combine to two square meters, but one of the walls has taken, taken precedent over the other one. So quite interesting, right? And the reason why this is happening is because of joint precedence in walls. So if you go to your wall join tool, one wall always has priority over the other in the join, unless you do a mitre join. This is what we call a butt joint at the moment. So you can't actually see it, but one of these is basically telling the other one to finish. Um, if I lower my view range, you might be able to see what's going on. I'll just take it down to 500 above the floor. Interesting, I still can't. Still can't see it. That's quite interesting. Oh, cut plan. I'll just take my top down to 600 as well. Hmm. Still can't see it. It's, yeah, it's very interesting. All right, never mind. Not the focus. But essentially one wall is taking priority over the other. So if I just say to cycle the junction, you'll see that now the relationship is inverted. One of the other walls has taken priority and the area is different. So you need to be really careful with this when you're taking area faces of walls um, because one of the walls essentially takes out the area of the other one. And if I wanted to truly measure something like the outside face of the brick of these walls, this might not be the best way to do it because really what we have here is 1.135 of brick and more or less the same depending on how you joined the brick. Obviously, you'd be coining it on the corner. So maybe it's an okay way to measure it, but you need to be really aware that what you see isn't always what you get with certain categories in Revit. When they join to each other, that can be quite confusing for Revit to communicate to you. So it's not always 100% accurate. You need to be really careful with that. So hopefully that sort of makes sense. Um, there's not really any easy way 
for me to give you a strategy to work with things like this. This is where your company needs to test, innovate, measure, and see if the way you can use the system works for you. So maybe you have tolerance that you apply to certain cat categories of elements, or you accept a certain tolerance in the inaccuracy of what you measure. You say, we're within 10% of our estimate on our wall surface face, for example, up to you. And obviously the area of this wall doesn't reflect the length in both aspects. So internally, I only have 865 and 865 technically of exposed paint, for example. So using the area in this case would be a bad choice because it doesn't, it's not truly reflecting how much internal uh, area you really have. Um, it's only reflecting really the, the length based on the walls placement, which in this case is point to junction. So just be really mindful of that. As well as that, you have to be really careful that if you don't model well with walls, you can get some very inaccurate takeoffs. So let's just disallow join on both of these walls so that they don't have to join to each other. And I'll just model these all the way up to each other and get them to clash. So you'll see that the schedules are quite unforgiving. Now both of the walls are counting all their area, even where they overlap, because the walls aren't joined, so they're not being told to stop short. So just be really careful with bad modeling because that can happen. All right, so we're on to the last technique. Um, this one's pretty hard. I'm not gonna go too far into it. I'm just gonna show you that it's available and that it does work if you know what you're doing. But essentially this is a rate cost by material or a material takeoff. It's very complicated and it relies on you setting up your materials really well and knowing where they're applied and uh, making sure that your elements are modeled correctly so that all the exposed face of material that's available is true and correct. So it's very risky if you get this one wrong or if you use it without understanding how it really works. So I'll break it down really quickly. But let's say we wanna measure all the paint in this room. So the paint doesn't just occur in walls. It occurs in ceilings. It might occur in bulkheads or uh, feature elements. There's so many things to consider when you consider by material, especially for trade crossing materials like plasterboard. So just keep this in mind. It's very hard. I'm just gonna show you how the tool works, but not how you can do an entire cost takeoff to do this because it's quite hard. Uh, but essentially there's another tool under view, under schedules, called, uh, where was it? Material takeoff, there we go. So this is really important. It's, it's basically gonna create a list of subcomponents of materials from any Revit family category. You can do a multi-category schedule, um, but it won't pick up every single category. So just play with that one and you'll quickly figure out what's, what gets in the schedule and what doesn't. Um, I'll do one now for you just so you can see what's actually in there. So we'll just add cost and family and type. And I think, yeah, so we don't have anything in there at the moment because walls, floors, ceilings, all these system elements, they don't get into multi-category schedules. Things like doors, furniture, especially equipment, so loadable content, that's what shows up in those. So just be mindful, you won't be able to lump everything together um, in this way. Sorry, I need to make a material takeoff. So let's just do a takeoff of our walls. So we're gonna measure all the materials that go into our walls. So I'm gonna add the cost and you'll have a whole set of additional things you can add based on material. So what I'll do is I'll add the material area. I'll add as paint, just to show you how that one works. I'll add material cost and material name. So you'll sort of see the confusion that comes in with this method now. I'll just move the cost down to the back. All right, so we're not gonna get elements um, in this type of schedule. Uh, I'll just put the name at the front. What we actually get is every occurrence of that material in a wall. So you'll see what we actually get is all the layers of each wall. So we have the air infiltration barrier of both walls, the masonry in both walls, and the brick in both walls. So it's measuring it uh, based on layers. Very, very important to understand. And each category is slightly different how it works. I'm just going to show you walls because they're a more complex category. So let's just reallow our join in this case. Um, so at the moment, our balls have a cost associated to them of $50 a square meter. In our material takeoff, notice that that's appeared for every single layer in the wall. So that's inaccurate because that $50 is a system cost, not a layer cost. We're not going to apply that rate to the air infiltration barrier, the masonry and the brickwork because all of these are being scheduled as the area of the wall. So we'd be blowing out our cost three times over if we did this based on the cost field. What we care about is the material cost field, very different. Um, so what we need to do in this case is apply cost to the materials within the walls. So what you do, 
jump into your materials and you'll have a property you can manipulate in here instead. This is why material management becomes so important at this point, because if you don't have costs in your materials or you don't have descriptions or names that make sense, your cost isn't going to make sense either. So at the moment, I'm just going to say that my brick is $50 a square, actually I'll say $40 a square meter. My air infiltration barrier, I don't actually want to schedule. I'm not really costing this. Let's say we're just doing a masonry takeoff of our walls. So what I'll do here is give it a comment and just say, do not cost. And then likewise, we'll make our masonry. Let's say this is a bit more expensive because it's a block. So under cost, we'll say this is $60 a square meter. If we revisit our takeoff, you'll see now we should have picked up those cost rates. Interesting, I mustn't have committed the masonry change. I'll just double check that. It looks like our masonry cost hasn't shown up. Yeah, it didn't get committed. I'll just make sure I do that. Cool, there we go. Okay, so now you can see we have cost for our masonry and our brick. Let's say we are costing our infiltration barrier somewhere else. So maybe it does have a cost, but it, we don't want to include it in this specific schedule. So what you need to do is actually filter it out of your schedule. So we're going to add comments and we'll make it a hidden field and we'll filter based on the comments. And we'll say that what we're looking at has to make that the comment doesn't equal uh, do not cost. And we'll okay that. I'll just double check my air infiltration barrier material and make sure it has that value still in there. No, I mustn't have committed that either. Whoops. Do not cost. And there you go. Now our air infiltration barrier is managed out, so we don't see it anymore. What you can do here as well is we can do subtotals. So we can do sort by material name and don't itemize. So now we just see all our masonry and all our brick. What we could do then is, remember we've got two pieces of masonry or brick each, so we actually need to total these. So at the moment it's telling me it's one square meter. That's not true. We actually have two square meters of both in lineal, lineal meter. So what we need to do is go to our area and do a calculate totals. We also need to do, for a cost we don't have to, because this is sort of like our rate cost. Um, we're going to just get rid of our cost field just to avoid confusion because it's the wrong one. And we had a calculated field and we'll just call this total cost because we have a rate cost and we have something to measure the rate by which is the area so we're going to measure this as currency and we'll say this is the area times the cost and again we're going to need to divide this by one meter and one meter just to manage the units out and we will interesting uh, we need to calculate the cost here there we go. So now we have our material cost and we have our total cost. So because we have two square meters of each, you can see we have double that for our total cost. So that's how you can do a, a takeoff, um, but you need to be really careful with some things. One thing you've got to be so careful of, careful of is the paint tool. So imagine you had a brick wall and then you painted the outside of it with brick because the pattern wasn't working. And then someone came and fixed the pattern, no problems. You'd think that this wouldn't cause any issues because it's just brick on a layer of brick. You'd be surprised what happens in this case. Let's just paint all the sides with masonry. Actually, now we'll use, we'll use something silly. We'll use gypsum wallboard. Let's say I paint the interior wall with gypsum. Obviously that's wrong because it's not a true BIM workflow, but check out what happens. We still have the masonry because it's inside the wall, it's a layer. And it thinks that the gypsum wallboard is like another layer which it isn't. So if you painted your wall in brick, you'd end up with double the brick in your wall. So you've got to be so careful with things like this because they're just wrong. They won't work. Um, so be really mindful that the paint tool is very dangerous. The only good thing about it is that it says it's paint. So what you can do is add a paint catch in here. You can say as paint has to equal to no, and then anything that's paint is out. So just be really mindful of that. So that's sort of how the quantity takeoff material tool works, but you really need to experiment with it to understand it in its entirety. It can do some very powerful things. It can do like fabric area based on a family. So there's a lot of advanced things it can do, but just be really careful because you can see there there's a lot of pitfalls and traps if you're not modeling properly or you're not setting up your BIM content properly. So that's pretty much it. That's four techniques you can use um, in order to cost your model or get quantities. 
Um, so that's pretty much it. And then bringing it all together, as you can see, you can export these things all to Excel and you can put these all together in one big file and then add your cost to a total report. Or you could use something like Dynamo or special plugins that can direct this data together and put it all together for you. Just keep that in mind. Some things to remember, just like some final parting advice. Um, when in doubt, just check, measure, measure manually, check what your schedules are telling you versus what you're seeing. Um, because at the end of the day, BIM can make mistakes if you don't set it up properly. And when you're not in doubt, it's usually good to just check anyway, just to make sure that it's doing what it's meant to be doing. And remember, you're not the quantity surveyor. <laughs> this doesn't take away the importance of their role. They are still liable for cost advice. You are typically not as an architect or an engineer. It's not your specialty, it's not your expertise. This is just your way of helping them and speeding up your design process by educating yourself on cost in the process. So definitely don't, don't tell the cost surveyor that you are the captain now. Uh, it won't, doesn't work that way. Um, but hopefully the cost surveyors or the quantity surveyors, they should appreciate this if you do it for them because it's, it's very rare that architects or engineers go out of their way to do this for quantity surveyors and I really feel for them because I can really see why some of them don't use BIM because they're not really feeling very welcome when no one else helps them even start with this process. So try to help them get into the picture and maybe they'll do it next time on a project or they'll just find it easier to work with you. Maybe they'll come back and work with you again. Um, so be their friend. <laughs> they're good people. And remember, no half measures, literally. Um, half measures are just where you do something the lazy way and as a result, you get a bad result or your BIM model's just not gonna work. So no half measures. <laughs> so hopefully that helps you better understand 5D BIM and uh, quantity surveying uh, that you can do out of Revit um, and just in general. Um, if you've got any feedback or comments, feel free to leave it down below. Um, I make videos two to three times a week and I'll continue to do so for a very long time, hopefully. If you're not already following and subscribing, feel free to do so and hopefully I'll see you in the next video. Thanks. Take care.